1971, a private home in South Minneapolis became the birthplace of a movement for marriage equality worldwide. The Reverend Roger Lynn, a United Methodist minister, led the ceremony. Matrimony witnessed by friends bound Jack Baker to Michael McConnell. This is a serious occasion, but not a somber one. Why not? <laughs> I strongly believe that the church uh, and the community as a whole should be in the business of supporting loving relationships. Michael and Jack, I, I knew, had a loving relationship, and they wanted to be uh, lifelong partners, and so I saw no reason for not supporting that uh, that commitment. So it was just a, a no-brainer for me. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Jack was the student body president on the Minneapolis campus of the University of Minnesota. Paul Hagen produced the controversial posters that excited gay students and got Jack elected. Formally, he was the president of FREE, the student organization that sponsored the wedding. I have never felt intimidated or, you know, anything at all about, you know, like hiding. And once I came out, you know, I just thought, anyone who doesn't like me for this part of me, uh, I don't need to know. And, uh, you know, it's their loss. Corrine Phelps, a 1966 high school graduate, and Stefan Irig attended the University of Minnesota. They did not graduate. Instead, they joined with their friends to form a team as part of an outreach program organized by the Minnesota Free University, which had no connection to the University of Minnesota. Program offices were located in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood of Minneapolis, next to the university. Their group voted to be known as Fight Repression of Erotic Expression, or FREE. When I went to FREE, I mean, there were, there were uh, meetings uh, which uh, typically had a speaker. Uh, the best speaker, I, or the one that I remember the most, was Anthony Buza, who was the Minneapolis police chief. He had uh, a wonderful bit of advice, uh, and he said, when it comes to your rights, no one's going to give them to you. You have to fight for them and take them. He, he was right, you know, and, and uh, I mean, nobody does it because it's the right thing. Do, you know, they grant it because there's a groundswell of opinion um, you know, that uh, this is wrong and it has to change. It seemed very active, it, it went on and, um, you know, it went on to Jack Baker being, uh, you know, elected as student body president and I did his, I, I did some of his campaign posters. A student member of the group formed an independent branch of FREE at U of M's East Bank campus. One professor agreed to sponsor the gay student Jack, a law student, was elected to be the first president. He promised an agenda of full equality. Months later, a faculty committee qualified the club for all student privileges. These gay activists were determined to be both proud and loud. In 1971, Minnesota's marriage statute did not forbid two adults of the same sex to marry. Friends encouraged me to obtain a license to marry legally. Members voted to sponsor the wedding. Jack and Michael applied first in Minneapolis. Their request was refused. While residing with friends in Mankato, an elected clerk of district court issued Michael a lawful marriage license. Without hesitating, Reverend Roger Lynn agreed to officiate at the wedding ceremony, September 3, 1971. I was excited going into it because uh, of, I, I, I really had no idea of how historically important the moment was. I was just excited about giving support to, to uh, this couple. When they kissed, and I thought, oh man, this is different. It really struck me. The marriage contract was certified by Reverend Lynn, then returned, all according to the statute then in effect. The clerk refused the document she issued, even though the marriage statute clearly stated that a licensed property executed must be made public. The same statute gave the power to dissolve a marriage contract exclusively to the courts. In 2018, attorneys from Fredrickson and Byron Law Firm argued in the District Court of Blue Earth County, Minnesota, that the 1971 marriage has never been dissolved or annulled by judicial decree. Also, no grounds currently exist under which invalidate the marriage. An order by Assistant Chief Judge Gregory Anderson found the wedding to be in all respects valid and required the marriage to be recorded. A notice was posted on Minnesota's official marriage system, October 3, 2018. 
Thus ended all attempts by bullies with power to ignore the rule of law. The county delivered three copies of the marriage certificate, which I had previously requested in my letter dated 29 September 2014. Historians insisted the wedding sponsored by Free was the earliest same-gender marriage ever recorded in the public files of any civil government. Beginning in 2015, the Social Security Administration allowed the retired partner of a same-sex couple to share spousal benefits after the marriage was recorded in the public record of any government. Our claim remained on hold after it was filed, pending confirmation by a Minnesota court. It was processed after we delivered to the local Social Security office a copy of the marriage certificate that was prepared by the county, posted on Minnesota's official marriage system, and certified. Benefits unpaid were reimbursed and continued monthly thereafter. It took 47 years of litigation to defeat persistent obstruction to both their marriage and Social Security benefits. I am your brother and sister, your mother and father. I am your employer and your co-worker, your novelist, your factory worker, your poet, your social worker, telephone operator, librarian, representative in Congress and clerk. I am a person. I am an American. I am gay. Before free, the phrase gay marriage was widely used as a euphemism to describe historical events involving a church blessing or a private celebration among friends. Without a recorded marriage, title to assets did not transfer automatically from the surviving partner, but instead required a will. Free's loud and persistent demands for full equality gave birth to a modern gay movement. Naysayers who insisted that marriage equality must go slow were ignored. Tom Higgins, formerly a monk and now a gay activist, crafted gay pride as a chant to discredit the two terms often condemned as sins by the Catholic Archbishop in Minneapolis and St. Paul. The free agenda expanded into a parade of love in Minneapolis. Gay pride celebrations spread throughout Minnesota into other states and around many countries. Young voices emerged in the summer of 1977. A new generation of activists, primarily lesbians, understood what their elders did not. If you do not stand tall and defend yourself, no one else will either. They demanded their birthright, a license to marry the adult of one's choice. We welcomed any leader who boldly proclaimed full equality for all and made their presence hard to be ignored. Young lesbians everywhere insisted that their contribution be recognized as LGBT pride. At that point, Michael and Jack saw how the free agenda was beginning to take a life of its own. On New Year's Day, 1980, they closed that chapter of their journey. They celebrated free success in helping to transform an entire planet by neutralizing reckless demands for excessive population. Over time, I watched quietly as the free agenda was slowly co-opted by promoters who increasingly rewrote history to justify any event that called itself pride. Such celebrations are a far cry from the original intent. Our next step required time to await action by the U.S. Supreme Court. We wanted assurance that every citizen is entitled to share equally all fundamental rights protected by law. Privacy was paramount while they prepared a new challenge in the courts. Also, Michael chose to avoid publicity while rebuilding his professional career, which was destroyed by the Board of Regents. I joined the Hennepin County Library System and rose to its upper levels of management. In 2012, the U of M's president, Eric W. Keller, bravely offered a gracious apology for the Board of Regents refusal to approve the job offered to Michael by the university librarian. Simply put, that decision was wrong and discriminatory. Of course, unfortunately, times and attitudes have changed since the unfortunate decision in 1970, but there is no excuse for the discrimination at any point of the university's history. As I said at the event on October 26, 2015, in which we celebrated receiving the Michael McConnell papers at our libraries, here at the University of Minnesota, we teach history, and we make history, and sometimes, when we find ourselves on the wrong side of history, we must learn from it. And the action taken by our board in 1970 to rescind Michael McConnell's job offer simply because of who he loved, and not because of his qualifications as a librarian, is today worthy of deep criticism. As I said in 2015, how our university treated Michael more than four decades ago, denying him a job because he was gay, was reprehensible. I regret that it occurred. 
Those actions then are absolutely opposed to the climate now that I, as president, and that our Board of Regents seek to promote. He called the board's treatment reprehensible, regrets that it occurred, and says the university's actions at that time were not consistent with the practices enforced today at the university. Included were hurtful insults expressed openly by individual regents toward Michael and other free members who lobbied for full equality. Michael accepted his offer and agreed to donate his archival materials to the Trader Collection housed in the U of M libraries. 